Episode 53, Mercian Domination and Cadwaller As a tide of Northumbrian power starts to ebb, it finds its old enemy ready to take its place, and in doing so creates a massive issue for the Welsh border kingdoms north and south. First, let's turn to Cadwaller, however, the purported son of Cadwallon, and as of 655 AD, the king of Gwyneth. The kingdom has taken a beating over the preceding few years, losing badly during the defeat of Cadwallon at the Battle of Heavenfield in 634, and then continuing to have problems therein, where it seems like Gwyneth remained an outside bit player for most of the rest of this century. Gwyneth was more or less sidelined in the final Battle of Penda in 654, when the king of Gwyneth, Cadavel, apparently left the battlefield, allowing Penda to be killed by Oswiu. Uh, he is highly looked down upon because of that, and we'll get into a bit of that. Cadwaller assumes the throne the next year in 655, and Cadavel is never mentioned again in anything other than legendary sources. Even as late as 1874, Cadavel was not a name used in Wales. The rise of Cadwaller appears to have been popular from the start compared to his predecessor. Now, the one problem is, is we know that Cadavel is not a son of Cadwallon, so we don't know, and Cadwaller is a son of Cadwallon, according to the genealogies, so it's hard to know exactly where he came from and where he went, whether he was a blood relation or what it was. One would suspect he probably was a blood relation, either a cousin of the king, uh, Cadwallon, or possibly maybe a cousin or a brother. Um, but like I said, Cadwell disappears, and this unfortunately is one of the things we're going to talk a lot about today, is about the absence of information. And obviously in this circumstance and situation, we definitely have an absence of information. Uh, the Chronicles of the Princes, which is where the Welsh annals have come from, speaks of Cadwaller and speaks of him in terms that are sainted, to say the least. Let me just read you an excerpt so you can kind of get an idea. 681 was the year of Christ when there was a great mortality in the island of Britain. In that year, Cadwaller ap Capwallen, the last king that was over the Britons, went to Rome. And there he died on the twelfth day from the Calends of May. And thenceforth Britain lost the crown of kingship, and the Saxons obtained it, as Merthin had prophesied to Gerthin with now, better known to us as Merlin and Vortigern. So, this idea that uh, Cadweller was a sainted figure who was holy, who went on pilgrimage to Rome, who died because of a plague, uh, we'll get into in more depth. But, but the legendary aspects of his life are very interesting to sort of look at. Early in his reign, all was less than great. In 658, he will send forces to help the Cornish kingdoms against the West Saxons in Exeter, only to have his army fail to stop the Saxons, who then completed the fall of Somerset. And after this, the Saxons controlled much of the southwest. We know really nothing else legitimately about his life other than his death. This comes because in 664, and again in 682, which is what the... The Chronicles of the Princes mentions there was plagues that ravaged Britain. The second one is actually blamed for the death of Cadwaller, that the plague had actually killed him. Now, whether that plague had hit before he went to Rome and he was ill as he got to Rome, or if it came about because he got it in Rome, that's not entirely clear. In fact, what I read you is the entire entry, so it's hard to know what is and isn't really trustworthy in that particular circumstance. Yet, somehow, this king becomes significant to the Welsh psyche. He is an Arthurian figure that later writers will dress up and make into something quite a bit different from what we understand. There may be a, a fair number of reasons why, but we don't honestly know them. He will be both the true once and future king. And Geoffrey Monmouth goes so far as to give a massive backstory to his life, much like he did with a lot of things where there was bits and pieces of information. He goes into great detail. 
In fact, it's felt that Geoffrey Monmouth uses the Histori Britonium, uh, his king, history of the kings of Britain, using uh, Ninius's Historia Britonium to try and dress his stories up. So anything that was in there, he just went and stretched and stretched and stretched. And this is one of those incidences. And Cadwaller is a very mythical figure because of this. In, he's in poetry. He's in stories. He has a lot of mythology surrounding him about the fact that there was predictions on his birth, that Merlin thought he was important, or Merthyn. Uh, all of this stuff is, of course, legendary. It's, it's stories. It's not truth. But it does make you wonder why they picked up. Because largely, I guess, the only thing you can really say about his reign is that it was relatively peaceful. The Gwyneth doesn't appear to have any major battles or many, many attacks in its actual region. And there's enough ability for them to, to share their military might that they can send troops to other places to fight battles. So there must have been a level sense of peace in the neighborhood, at least for that point. But unfortunately, we don't know the answer to that. Um, and some of this just comes about because of the end of Northumbrian influence and the reasons why Bede ends up focusing more on internal matters rather than external matters because of this change. And like I said, he was a larger-than-life figure in Gwyneth during a period of fading influence and power in the teeth of the first Northumbrian and then Mercian dominances. In fact, from 665 AD, the Northumbrians ceased to be a serious threat in the West. The Mercians' dominance begins almost immediately after the death of Pinda. His son, Wulfhera, takes advantage of the Northumbrian Empire crumbling, and in that vacuum, he moves the Mercians in, and they start to take over. In fact, if you look at the map I posted on Facebook earlier this week, uh, that's facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast, you'll actually see that, that there's a very wide range of influence that the Mercians have. They don't even just have their own lands that they control, or even the neighboring lands, but there's also lands even outside of that that they've come to control. And in a way, they become the dominant Midland Kingdom who influences the south. And anything south of the Humber is effectively, if not in their control, definitely in their sphere of influence. And that includes the Welsh kingdoms. We see that Welsh kingdoms become influenced enough that the alliances that once were the other way around were with Cadwallon. Penda was sort of the understudy with Wolf Hera and with his succeeding uh, kings. That changes. So what do we know about the effects of the Mercian dominance over the Heptarchy, and how did that affect the Welsh? Well, let's start with what we know. First, the Mercians were allies and sometimes apparently subservient, at least in the lesser partner with Penda. That appears to change as the Mercians grow from an uneasy ally to a threat to local control. The northern kingdoms of Powys and Gwyneth were effectively client kingdoms, who owed fealty, it appears, of some sort to the kings of Mercia. This may have been due to the way the war with Northumbria turned out and how weak both kingdoms were in the aftermath in the mid-7th century chaos. It also could come down to the fact that the Welsh didn't perceive at that point Mercia being an enemy and thus were willing to go with them on these things. And so it's not until later, like 100 to 200 years later, where that's flipped and you have a very different perspective. One evidence found in this period is a pillar of Elsa, Elisig, or Hengraus, uh, which means Old Cross. It was made in the middle of the 9th century, but it includes the ancestry of the kings of Powys going back to the Mercian predominance. The pillar is erected in honor of Elis ap Gwilyog, the great-grandfather of Kineg ap Cadel, who was the king of Powys. He claims that Elis seized control of the throne from the English by the sword born of fire. Now, one problem we have is there is no evidence in the sources of either of these men. Only tantalizing guesses, really. Pro Professor Charles Edwards actually postulated that the restoration of Powys came around the ascendancy of Offa in the mid-8th century, when Aethelbald, the king, was murdered and his successor was driven from power by Offa. It is interesting that rather than using the Welsh word for Saxons in the Latin text, it uses Anglorium, or Anglican, uh, 
which of course is the source of the word English. This again would point that the Mercians being the source of these Anglicans rather than Northumbria, simply because of the rise in Mercia in this period of time and control that they had over this area. Charles Edwards actually believes that the reason for the stone was erected was because Kinnig had been involved in a similar seizing of power when the Mercians once again domina dominated Powys after the Powys fortress of the Decante was destroyed in 822 AD. Thus, this would mark why the lineage was so critical to Powys freedom. In other words, trying to show that, hey, my great-grandfather did this and then I did it. You know, if it wasn't for us, you guys wouldn't be an independent kingdom anymore. You'd just be a part of Mercia. In other words, it's a way of standing out and standing up. And the only problem with this is, is that the, the, the pillar exists even today. But the problem is, is that unfortunately, the writings on it have actually worn off for the most part. And even in the day when they were written down by uh, some of the antiquarians in the 18th century, um, there still wasn't enough to give you a complete understanding of why this was happening. And it's, it's simply a guess by Charles Edwards as to why this pillar was put up and that it had something to do with that, because there's enough circumstantial evidence around it to make you think that it, it would explain a lot. In Gwyneth, as before stated, much of the kingdom seems to have slipped into source shadow. Eidwal reigns after his father, Cadwallar, and for much of the early period of the 8th century, but he is mentioned only briefly in any of the sources, usually only in context with his son Rodri, who rises to power after him. Rodri himself seems to have been reigning in quiet and gets an unkind reference, to say the least, because he was known as Rodri the Grey and Bald. So that's what I mean by quiet. We don't have any written sources telling us about these people. We just have an absence and a vacancy of information, which is very unfortunate. We should start by noting that for nearly a hundred years, for example, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle does not mention any Welsh battles or incursions or strife. The Welsh annals themselves spend most of the time talking about milk being turned to blood, plagues, ah, meteor showers and trips around the local region talking about various kings including the saxons and then basically a hot summer in 721 <laughs> so these were the big points from 682 to 750 we don't have a whole lot to go on no matter what source you use so why was wales such a place of darkness well one explanation would be the rise of Mercia as a predominant power in the region, and the influence of its kings likely meant that there was nothing really to talk about until the middle of the 8th century. This could be down to the peaceful settlement allowed both groups to flourish, as we talked about with Gwyneth earlier. There just may not have been a lot of wars going on at the time. Or it could be that the plagues in the latter half of the 7th century caused enough death so that there was little that the Welsh could do to go against, say, Offa and his fellow kings. And, or, conversely, that the plagues created an absence in soldiers, workers, all of those kind of usual things. And so thus, it takes a while to recover from that kind of thing, obviously, because if generations are being killed off, you're going to have at least a couple of decades of not having enough people to actually pull their weight. So work becomes plentiful and employees become pl very few so all of a sudden you have a total change in the way the economy starts to work and in wales where subsistence economy is much greater and the ability to actually uh, rely on other sources of income becomes much more difficult that that issue may have been the other problem it may have basically impoverished the kingdoms of wales and it may have created a situation where they just couldn't uh, make their mark and maybe because of that or maybe it's just down to the fact that the 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 writers and chroniclers were embarrassed by what was going on and didn't want to talk about it that's the reason for the travel log they get talking about the king of the franks they talk about the king of the saxons they talk about the irish they don't talk about the welsh and this is a welsh annal so that in a way shows that there was not much going on of course this will start to change once we reach the latter half of the 8th century as history and reality start to catch up to the Mercians and their former clients. Powys, who had made, been completely conquered, rose up once again to take control of its own destiny, and Gwyneth, 
The old powerhouse began to finally awake from its period of absence, which will eventually lead to Roderick the Great down the road, but they have to go through quite a change for that to happen. With the kings of the south, they begin, they begin to bring their own set of influences to Wales, as we finally get the return of Dyfed as a thing. Um, we also get the merging slowly of the smaller powers into a major power, and eventually will create its own larger kingdom in the southeast. But we're still a ways away from that. This is before the Vikings. This is before the West Saxons really become powerful enough to sort of influence the rest of Britain. And the Mercian power base is still quite strong right up until then. And we're going to go into a little bit more of this next week as we're going to talk more in depth about Offa and his influence both in Britain and outside of Britain and what it meant for the Welsh. Because the one thing he does is he creates a border, even if the border is mostly a mental border as opposed to a legitimate, you know, she to sea border as it's described by Ninius. Perception is reality. And that is what Offa does. He creates a border. So we'll get into a little bit of that next week. We'll also talk about why we think Powys ceased to exist, or at least became a non-entity, and why these kings had to rise up against them. Um, but I just, this week, wanted to focus on the fact that there isn't a lot of evidence. There's not a lot of details that we can perceive from what's gone on. The sources have been quiet through this period, so you can kind of understand why you know, it, it's unfortunate, but one of the, the aspects of when you study this history in this period is you don't come across a lot of information. And, and because of that, historians and archaeologists have to fill in the blanks the best they can. And sometimes you just don't have enough to go on to fill it in. But we'll do the best we can with this and we'll continue to move forward, as we always do, because we know that Wales has points where it just doesn't get enough writing, enough source material. But there's enough to go on that you can make some inferences. Thankfully, like I said, we found this pillar, which gives us an idea of what was going on in the middle of, of the 8th century and in the middle of the 7th century and kind of gives us a concept of that Powys had points where it was completely and utterly dominated by Mercia and that in both cases, kings rose up to try and take back control and it will happen one more time before we get to the 9th century. And I think... It's an interesting subject to continue to look at, and we will do what we can to kind of look at more archaeological sources to kind of fill in blanks as much as possible. And uh, we'll talk a bit more, like I said, next week about Offa and his influence. And I hope you're enjoying the, our podcast. And uh, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, you can always reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can talk to me on Facebook at Welsh... At facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And you can also reach out to me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod. Uh, if there's anywhere else you want to talk to me, uh, I'm sure there are ways of doing that as well. And if you want to talk to me on my my home account on Twitter, it's at John, J-O-N-D-M-P. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to, happy to talk to you, happy to discuss history, discuss culture, discuss your photos of cool places that you've been to and you know just generally answer any questions you might have one of the things i hope to do with our patreon is to have a couple of episodes where i'm answering questions for you guys so please please continue to to ask away and i will try and answer what i can and and like i said if you want to check me out on patreon it's patreon.com forward slash welsh history thank you everyone have a great week we'll talk to you later bye Edge of the Abyss Creations is a proud sponsor of the Welsh History Podcast, your one-stop shop for unique jewellery, paintings, and other crafty creations. You can find us at facebook.com slash edgeoftheabyss1. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more info, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.